if I learned one thing from Ryan's loss, it's that um, life is very precious and very fleeting and you have to make the most of the opportunity and the relationship and the time that you're given. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for being here with me today for the latest episode of the Run to the Top podcast brought to you by Runners Connect. So I know this is a busy time of year and I just want to take a moment to really thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for tuning in today and every other week. The support and time you dedicate to Runners Connect is the gift that just keeps on giving week after week. So thank you so much for that. Last week, we heard from Katie Sherratt, who was the CEO of Back on My Feet. And wow, what an episode that was. So as we settle into the cold nights, it was something that really warms our hearts. And okay, that was really cheesy, but it really was a wonderful episode. We love our sport and runners are very passionate about running, which is what makes our community so strong as we love to help out other runners And we love to kind of band together when it comes to battling those rumors from non-runners about how bad running is for us. Do you remember all the times running is bad for your knees has come around? Yeah, me too. Well, running also went under fire uh, when an elite runner passed away a few miles into his marathon some years back. If one of the fittest people on the planet can have a heart attack, well, that must mean every runner is putting their life in danger every single day, right? Well, that's probably what people were saying to you, and you probably heard the story of Ryan Shea's passing, but the chances are you heard a version of the story that wasn't quite true. And today, I have Ryan's former wife on the show to talk about what really happened and just how hard it hit her. So Alicia is a professional runner herself, and you'll hear about her running journey, especially during that grieving process. This is one of those episodes that hits you right in the heart. But she also has some fantastic advice that she's learned through what she's been through. So I want to leave the rest to Alicia. But first, I want to thank Sockney and Body Health for sponsoring this podcast. It really helps so much. And I really hope you're enjoying their products as well. So after a word from them, we will meet Alicia. Running is tiring. We know that. But the accumulation of miles is what really gets us, leaving us sore and exhausted. I take Body Health Perfect Amino Tablets to improve recovery, and you should too. You will notice a difference, and you can learn more at bodyhealth.com. This podcast is brought to you by Saucony. For those of you who have not heard of this brand, they're the best, really. I don't just wear Saucony for every run, but they also have a great collection of casual clothes for everyday use, which I live in. Use coupon code TINA for 10% off your next order. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Alicia. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm excited to join you today. No, this is great to have you on. And, uh, you know, I'm sure some people listening will have heard quite a lot about you, maybe even looked into you a little bit in the past. Um, And then others may not have even heard anything. You know, there are so many runners in this running world, so it can be difficult to stay on top of everyone. So maybe you could start by telling us a little about your background, you know, how you began and, um, you know, after playing basketball and uh, doing rodeos, how you transitioned into running. I, so kind of starting back from the beginning, I started running um, mostly just to be a better basketball runner. Um, I grew (laughs) up in northeastern Wyoming and basketball was kind of everyone's world so Mm. I was just looking for any advantage to be better and then as my height topped out at five four (laughs) and um about a hundred pounds I decided that um probably my my running skills were going to be a better use to me in the future so made really hard transition for me at the time it seemed pretty dramatic to to leave basketball and that whole world. But um, I started running more and just really, really loved the, I was always a hard worker. Even when I was little, I would just practice something for hours and hours and hours. So I really took to that part of, of running and kind of progressed through high school and 
was able to get a scholarship to run for Stanford University and spent my college career there and then graduated and kept running and then stopped running and resumed running and kind of had a, a little more volatile relationship with running than I did when I was um, younger. And here I am now in Flagstaff, Arizona. I've been here for almost nine years and I'm still racing and competing and now coaching and just really love the sport of running. And I've, I've had a, a huge um, variety of experiences in the sport and it's just something that's become a part of my life. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. And that's wonderful. And, and, you know, obviously there are ups and downs and we're going to go through those today. You know, everyone listening, I'm sure has had some ups and downs with running, um, you know, that you, you, I'd be saying you weren't normal if you had just only had good experiences, but yours yeah. <laughs> may be a little bit more extreme in some directions, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But before we move on, um, you did also, well, you, it says on your website that you also used to do um, rodeos. Um, and I was just wondering, because I personally used to horse ride as well, if you found that um, if you were kind of competing at it, if there was anything that you had from the horseback riding that kind of shaped you into the runner or the person that you are today, did that affect your running in any way, would you say? Absolutely. I would say not so much from a competitive standpoint, but from a work ethic standpoint, if you, um, if you compete with horses and horses are part of your lifestyle. And for me, that was in the form of, of rodeo. Um, it's, it's, um, at a young age, it's a very big responsibility because you have these beautiful, powerful animals that are kind of relying on you and you have to take care of them and learn very specific skills that allow you to not only get better, but to, to be safe and take care of the animal adequately. And so it was just a lot of responsibility. I mean, it was every day, like there's no break from just like, oh, I just don't really want to do this right now. And um, so I think that was great for me to learn at a young age, just that that work ethic and that responsibility. And mm -hmm. more importantly, it was the whole rodeo community um, was a very tight knit community and just a very hard working um, group of people with a high level of integrity. And it really taught me things that I think are valuable as a person and as an athlete. And mm -hmm. so um, I really carry that forward with me in my running career and just that appreciation of the strength of the the community that you're within and trying to to build that and enhance that. It's not just about you doing your best. It's about this kind of collective um, entity and you really are a better version of yourself, I think, when you're in that kind of an environment. Mm -hmm. And how does that compare to the running community? Because when you were describing that, you know, that almost could have paralleled what people would say about the running community. Would you say it's, you know, the same kind of thing, just obviously a different passion? Exactly. I would say it's very similar. And I think that that's why I have kind of found myself, you know, being more rooted in the running community, even as I get older. And um, I would say, especially I've found that that's true in the trail running community. It's, it's a little less, I don't know how else to say it, but a little less cutthroat maybe than like the road and track realm where mm -hmm. um, there's not like quite a division between elite or professional runners and, and the mid to backpackers. And, and I really love that. I love yeah. that it's just like a family of people going out there to, to really put their best forward. And yeah. so um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's wonderful. And and I've definitely seen that through the other guests that we've had on the show. They've kind of mentioned the same the same thing with the trail and ultra, ultra running side of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, after college, you, you had a lot of success um, and you moved to Mammoth Lakes, um, but you did struggle. So I thought maybe you could kind of share with us, you know, what happened, because often people think of professional running as this, you know, you're just this gazelle who runs along and everything's going great. And it's just like the dream job for all runners. But maybe you could kind of show us that it's not always what it seems and, and you know, what your experience with that was. And uh, yeah, just tell us whatever you feel like about that. Sure. Well, so I, um, I was really blessed to go to a college and be on a team that um, was just already performing at a high level. And I, 
I just kind of, you know, got just kind of tucked in and, and went along with it and really, really benefited from having a great team and um, was able to win two NCAA individual championships and team championships and everything was just kind of wonderful and smooth sailing. And then my senior year, the day before we were leaving for the NCAA championships, I had an accident where a ladder collapsed underneath me and I fell and hit my head and lost consciousness for a long time and um, ended up with a really, really bad concussion and cervical injury. And my sacrum got like hit something when I fell as well. So just all around, I really, really beat up my body. And um, unfortunately, you know, I was like mentally really out of it after it happened. And didn't really have the best medical care. And I was kind of sent along to the NCAA championships the next day and um, kind of ran through it. But um, my body was um, in in shock and like it just kind of became this downward spiral from there where I ha- just kept training and competing as I was expected to do and didn't really have, um, yeah, I just didn't have great medical attention. And so I just kept getting worse and worse um, to the point where I was like really even struggling to get through my classes and like remember to do homework or just have like remember anything in general. And so um, I thought that once I graduated, I would kind of take a month to rest up. And then I had this great opportunity to run with the uh, the Mammoth Track Club, which had Nina Castor, who was, you know, my female distance role model and Ned (laughs) Kifleski and a a lot of other great athletes. And so I took that opportunity, but my, my injuries, my cervical injuries really just wreaked havoc on my running. And so I eventually had to, to stop and kind of just take my health into my own hands and try to figure out what was going on. So I went from like the highest of highs to just like, I didn't even want to run like a fun run 5k ever again in my life. Like I was in just so much pain day to day that I couldn't like fathom being a runner ever mm-hmm. again. So yeah, it really swung from one end of the spectrum to the other. Mm-hmm. And was it like just physical or did you kind of reach a point where you just kept getting physical things go wrong and eventually emotionally it just sucked all the fun out of it? Or was it you wanted to keep going with the mental, but physically you just couldn't handle it? The physical really wore on me mentally and emotionally to the point where I I just didn't want to run. I couldn't I couldn't fathom running without pain. So mm. I, I don't know. I mean the physical definitely became before the mental um because I I kind of dealt with it for two years and didn't really have any answers and um I don't I think I was like trying to be kind of just tough about it and not really talk about it or not like whine or, you know, be weak. And so I don't think I really expressed to like people around me how bad I felt. So all they saw was that just this decline, you know, without really knowing specifically why. So yeah, it became like a really hard mental and physical cycle. Um, Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do for myself. That's the most frustrating thing. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, mentioned that um you didn't want to kind of let on you wanted to just kind of tough it out and um just curious uh now you are a coach yourself do you think that experience taught you how to read people a little bit better to see if they are actually struggling more than they're letting on or how has that helped you to be a better coach because you kind of know how runners are with we like to just say oh everything's fine or I don't want to wimp out or whatever Absolutely. I think that one of the the biggest keys to to having a successful coach athlete relationship is being able to kind of read that athlete and um, what type of person they are. So when I work with somebody like myself, if I see that people start, you know, they do eight miles for their long run instead of 13 and their time starts to decline or their enthusiasm starts to decline. Like it's usually not that they're just don't want to work hard. It's that something else is, is going on underneath the surface. So 
Yeah, I that's really given me a lot of insight. And I think that sometimes when runners struggle, especially at a higher level, a lot of times people say, oh, oh that person's just a head case or like they need to pull it together. And I definitely had people kind of put that on me. And now I can, I, I have this perspective of, you know, somebody that's really passionate and driven about running, rarely do they just decide like, okay, today I'm just going to start being a head case and Mm -hmm. just make everything kind of messy and, um, you know, not really try as hard or you don't really lose desire like that if you're naturally a competitive person that wants to do well. And if you love running. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I'm a lot more sensitive and maybe intuitive in that respect. Yeah, no, that would make sense. And then, and then when you, you know, kind of decided enough was enough, um, that must have been really difficult to kind of follow your heart when, you know, all we're ever taught is don't quit, don't give up. So how did you, how did you make yourself be able to do that and just step away? It was, it was really hard because I had never in my life kind of given up on something or, or quit or stepped away. And it really was important that I had people around me that, that did know me kind of from start to finish and could see the ways that I was struggling and, and really kind of step in and give me wisdom and encourage me to, to stop and take care of my health and figure out what was going on and, and seek, you know, medical attention and, One of those people was Lauren Fleshman. We were both on the Mammoth team together and we were over in Europe um, training and racing one summer. And I remember it very vividly. She sat down and she's like, you just have to do something like don't listen to your coach. Don't listen to your agent right now. Like you just need to take care of yourself. And, um, and having her tell me that, I don't know why, like it kind of released me to be like, you know what? Like, yeah, you're right. Like I can, I can do this. And it kind of felt like a weight off of me that I just, you know, knew that that was the better thing to do. So I think sometimes it's good to have when, especially when you're having difficulty, like have people in your life that can, can give you that wise counsel that you can't necessarily see for yourself in the moment. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's, it's amazing that you, the amount of people that mention Lauren and how she's the one that turned their life around or she's their inspiration. It just blows my mind. She, I mean, just what a girl, like really is just someone very special. Um, She's very special. (laughs) And then, so you went to coaching yourself, but was that Mm -hmm. difficult to coach other people kind of being in the world and seeing other people succeed? Or like, could you separate that quite easily in your mind? I could separate that because I, I've always, growing up and in my family and my community, it was really valued to um, use your strengths and your talents to not just like be the best version of yourself, but also to like help other people. And so I just kind of saw it in that way that I didn't realize how much, um, kind of wisdom and experience I had gained throughout my own running career that it was really cool to see that I could translate that into to reaching out and helping other people. And so, you know, I, I don't think I would have admitted at the time because I had such a sour relationship with my running, but I still really loved running. And so it was really, really quite, um, uh, I don't know, just a, a rewarding thing to be able to reach into other people's mm-hmm. lives and, and to help them and, I also realized too that coaching is like 50% helping people, you know, work towards their goals, but it's also 50% just kind of partnering with them in their life and like being, being their fan, being their support, being their encourager. And so I, I loved it right away. Oh, that's great. And, and must've been a nice feeling for you to know that you were making a difference in people's lives like immediately. So that is, that is good to hear. Um, and okay, so the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about is something that, um, you know, may bring up some, you know, tough moments, but you did give me the go ahead to kind of ask you about it. Um, and, you know, most many runners would have heard the story um, of your husband, Ryan Shea, um, but they might not have put it together um, that it was him. So 
people often get this story wrong of what happened and it kind of was taken out of perspective by um, many, you know, news news publishers and sources. So can you kind of share with us your version of what happened and, uh, you know, just kind of set the story straight? Sure. So just to maybe backtrack a little bit to that period of time when I was struggling um, with my cervical injury, that's when, that's the time when I met Ryan. So um, as difficult as things were on the running front, um, I, you know, it was the, also like the best time in my life because I met the love of my life and um, we developed a really beautiful relationship and just grew very close very quickly. And um, so as my running kind of faded out, this relationship became um, just a, an incredibly positive thing in my life. And um, and I continued to support him in his own training and racing. And um, the, the biggest goal for him was the 2008 Olympic trials, um, which were actually run in 2007. And so um, he, uh, you know, undoubtedly the, the work ethic and um, the, the character that he's portrayed and ha- or has been portrayed about him is, is absolutely true. He was the hardest working person I've ever met. He was so passionate about doing everything a hundred percent that it was, it kind of took me aback. I had never <laughs> met somebody that was um, just that all in um, and committed. So um, that certainly is true. The, I think the, the unfortunate thing that I see about the way that he was portrayed is that he was so much more than a runner. Um, he was an incredible human being and, um, a lot of things that came out after his passing just kind of made him out to be this like obsessive extreme runner, um, which, you know, he, yeah, he was dedicated and he was hardworking, but, um, he was a much more well-rounded person than that. And his main focus was really pouring into other people. And so, um, that's sad to me because I, I think it, it elevates running to something more than it should be in the scope of, you know, our, our lives, um, and the legacy that we live, Mm -hmm. leave. So, um, and I also realize that, you know, any, any publication, they're trying to put out new something that is kind of catchy or, Mm -hmm. um, intriguing. And so a lot of, articles that have come out have done that with Ryan's life. And it's been really disheartening, but I also realize that that's just kind of the way the industry works. And, um, runner's world actually just republished an article, um, that they ran in 2008 about him. And it was really strange rereading it. And I'm like, man, this is like reading a storybook. Like (laughs) so many of these things are exaggerated or they're not true. And I started to get really upset again. Um, and then, you know, it's just, that's just what it is. And mm-hmm. people that knew Ryan and were touched by him know the person that he was. Um, so, and I think that there was also a lot of kind of controversy when he initially passed away because the cause of death was unknown. And it took a really, really long time to get all of the autopsy reports. And, um, you know, he, the, the, he passed away because um, of a heart issue. He had an enlarged heart, which most runners do from just the cardiovascular workload. His was even more enlarged, which um, if you have kind of any, any sort of heart abnormality, it puts you at a greater risk because of the, the way the heart pumps and um, just the way our cardiac output works. And he had scarring on his heart. It, it was old fibrosis that was caused. They, they theorized that it was caused from when he had pneumonia as a child and didn't go to the doctor and it was kind of left untreated. And I think this is maybe when he was around like five or six years old, but it's the type of fibrosis that they would, would be common to see from something like that. Um, so he had that, that thickening and scarring around his heart and that combined with um, his enlarged heart, it just created an electrical misconduction in his heart that just happened. I mean, it, it, it's, 
it's very rare, but it can happen and it did happen. So it wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with the way he lived his life or overtraining or undertraining or, you know, he didn't do drugs and alcohol when he was younger. He certainly didn't use performance enhancing drugs, which I think a lot of people were quick to say like, well, if a, a young guy, 28 year old guy has a heart attack, there must be something foul going on. Mm-hmm. Um, and the reality is, you know, that can happen to a 13 year old boy playing basketball. It just can happen. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess I would say that's kind of a, a summary of some of like the biggest kind of mix, misconceptions surrounding his mm-hmm. passing. And just one thing, um, if you can confirm this to me, but um, a lot of, uh, you know, people when they hear that, uh, you know, he passed away like during a marathon, they think, oh, well, you know, he was pushing himself too hard. But this occurred, if I'm correct, at about five miles in. So he wouldn't have been, you know, it wouldn't have been that he wasn't at that point where he was, you know, his all cylinders were screaming stop. He would have been very early in the race where, you know, he would have been relatively calm at that point. So was that, do I have that right with the? Yes, that's absolutely true. And um, I actually still have his watch from the race um, and that had his, his splits on there. He was taking, this is before um, he was just wearing like a, a, a basic Nike watch that he was taking splits and they were running really easy. I mean, they were running a pace that would be appropriate for female marathon runners. Mm -hmm. Um, and for these guys was like a jog and it was a really kind of cold, windy, blustery day. And so, you know, they were, all of the guys were kind of tucking in and slowing down to not do the work and be leading in the wind. So they were running extremely easy. Like Mm -hmm. it wasn't even a workout pace for him. Well, yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clear that up. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that must have been like absolute worst nightmare for you um, going through that. And I thought maybe you could share with the listeners, um, you know, uh, how you kind of handled it after, after it happened. You know, you kept training, you kind of refused to grieve and allow yourself that time to recover so and you know this could be a lesson to other people so I thought maybe you could share with you know how you kept going with your training and what happened afterwards yeah it's it's interesting because you know there's no there's no real like plan or guideline of how you navigate such a big dramatic life tragedy I mean we got married and we had started building our life together and planned on, you know, it was like that, that's just, uh, everything forward in life was together. And mm-hmm. we were so excited about that. And so to have that stripped away so suddenly, um, was just, it's, it's even hard. I can't, I can't even put into words how, um, traumatizing and, and painful that is. So, um, not really, I, I didn't really know how to handle it. Um, and, I, you know, my way of handling the, the grief and the weight and the pain was I just would run until um, I was so tired. I was kind of like numb. You know, that was like kind of my daily dose of medicine that I could at least have like two hours of getting out from underneath like the weight of the grief. And so um, I, I was training for the 2008 Olympic trials, which were in the summer. And I think I did it partly because I, I just didn't know what else to do. You know, it was like my default, like everything in my life was different. And so I tried running was like the one thing that was constant and familiar. Mm -hmm. And I knew, and I knew how to get up and train. And so I think that it was good to kind of have that routine. But when I started using it, um, kind of, um, you know, just run my emotions away. That became very, um, uh, it became very detrimental because I was really fit. So I could like just go out and just run crazy hard. And then, you know, and then I would be emotional all day. And then I was dealing with all the um, just legal things and paperwork that go along with losing a spouse. And then at night I wouldn't sleep because all my emotions would catch mm-hmm. up with me and I would have nightmares and 
I would just relive all these things and I'd wake up and I'd run hard again. And so um, it became, yeah, just a really, really destructive cycle. And I, I didn't quite realize what I was doing in the time because I was just living like literally like minute by minute. And mm-hmm. I was living in a community of other young runners and, you know, I, I, nobody really stepped in and was like, okay, just, it's okay to rest. It's okay to breathe. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to not act like you're strong and you're like fighting through this, you know, it's okay just to let down. And I think that if I were to speak into somebody's life that was similar to mine at that time, I would just reassure them that like, it's okay to be weak. Like it's okay to like, this thing has totally wrecked your life. It's okay to acknowledge that you don't have to like constantly be toughing it through it, you know? So, um, I definitely have a lot of hindsight about that, but the reality is I was just doing the best that I knew how to do at the Mm -hmm. time. Yeah, no. And, and, you know, I'm sure many of us would, (laughs) would have acted in the same way and it makes total sense. You know, that's the time you can, you can control. You can't really, you don't really have control over too much else um, in your life. But like you said, you can numb yourself with that pain and it's kind of almost a bit like self-harm. You're kind of using that pain to like take away from those feelings. Um, So anyone listening who maybe is going through something really tough in their life or has a loved one who is going through some tough times in their life, what would you say, what would you like to say to them or what would you say to give them advice? I think that, you know, just like I mentioned previously that um, it's, I think it's really important when you're going through something that really reduces you to that level of weakness that it's good and important to let other people into your life that really have the ability to kind of give you strength and and can help you so that you're just not out there like fighting this battle on your own. And I think that's kind of how I felt or maybe the position that I put myself in. I was just trying to be tough and trying to be strong and all these things that like in our society we value, you know, is those are, those are characteristics that you want to have. But when something that um, dramatic happens in your life, like it's okay to like, let it, you know, to, to let it have its impact and not try to use all the strength to fight back against it. You know, that's for later on when you're trying to, to take steps forward. But grief is, um, an emotion that is okay to feel and to have. And so I think, you know, kind of acknowledging that and then finding like healthy ways to um, work through that pain, like going out and running, you know, a hundred plus miles a week at really hard paces, that's, it's self-destructive, just what Mm -hmm. you said. So finding kind of that balance and having people that can help you find that balance, I think are, are really important. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, unsurprisingly, your body did eventually break down. um, And unfortunately, it was just before the the trials. So, you know, just to add more, more um, heartbreak to what you were going through that, you know, you had to watch that and know that you couldn't even get to do that. Um, So, you know, it, it, you were, from what I've read, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, it took you four years before you went back to competition. Um, and Mm -hmm. you know two years to recover from kind of what you did to your body so um, you know if you could maybe explain to us like the dangers of overtraining you know people who think that oh if I'm not going to get injured or if I'm not injured then I'll be fine it you know it's not going to do me any harm Um, it makes me feel better right now but maybe just to kind of stop them in their tracks and realize that um that running hard, be it for grieving or be it just because you enjoy running hard, um, is not good for you in the long term. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that one thing I, I've really learned and, um, something that I am able to, to look at the athletes that I coach, um, in, in what they're going through in their lives is that, um, physical stress, um, can really take a toll, but emotional stress is, is the impact of physical stress times a hundred, 200, 300. I mean, it, it is so, it is so, 
um, can be so powerfully destructive in your body. And so if you have a period of time of physical stress or you are have emotional things going on in your life, um, those things really um, have to be factored in to, to training and um, overtraining um in comparison is, is a little bit easier to pop out of. But when you are overtraining because of all of this emotional stress, that, that makes you tip over a lot quicker, I guess, um, if I could put it that way. Um, it's, it's just really toxic for the body. And so um, it's, it's not just the overtraining, but it's like what factors are, are leading to the overtraining. So um, had I just been training hard. I mean, I could have taken a month off and just popped back out of it, but it was, um, it was that my body, my mind, my heart was all going through stress. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just, it's really, really powerful. And I think as athletes, you kind of have this false sense of, um, strength sometimes where you're like, okay, yeah, I can do this and I'll be fine. Um, until the day that you're not. And, um, when you get yourself that deep into a hole, it takes so much longer to, to come out of that because it affects, you know, various hormones in your body, um, all sorts of things that do not rebound overnight. They take months or even years. So, um, yeah, you just can't abuse your body no matter what the the reason is. It's, it's really, you can't get away with it. You're not like the exception to the rule when it comes to like physiological, like, you know, uh, just pathways and, and things that happen when you treat yourself that, that way. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, we're all, we can all be guilty of kind of thinking that we're the exception, you know, we're the one that can get away with something that no one else can. And, you know, I'm just as guilty as that. Uh, of it as anyone else is I mean we may have different ways that we do it like for me it's sleep I I feel like I can get away with less sleep and I probably can't but I feel like I can and you know everyone's going to have their um something that they think they're the exception but I'm glad you mentioned that you know in reality none of us are so no um and then how did this change your feelings towards running were you just you know did it, was this like the nail in the coffin that was like, I hate running or, um, did you still have it in your heart, um, all that time during that recovery process? Oh, I desperately wanted to run during that time. Um, just jog, just to, just to be outside, just to breathe. Um, I, it, it didn't diminish my desire to run. I just physically couldn't I it's it's crazy to imagine that I was like that deep in a hole that I just couldn't even like go out for a 20 minute jog but I you know everything in my life had been stripped away and I was like I just wish I could at least have this one thing you know just for Mm -hmm. like therapeutic reasons just to go out in the woods and 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 run and move um and it was a really challenging time of my life because like I said, everything had been taken away and running. And so like, just kind of there I was, I was like totally weak and unable to do so many different things. And so it, it was really a formative time in my life where, um, I was like, okay, I have nothing. So like, what am I going to do? You know, like, Mm -hmm. how am I going to, how am I going to just start taking one step at a time to try to kind of rebuild my life? And, um, and yeah, it was, it, it was a really pressing, difficult time, but I really wouldn't trade those, those years for anything because I think it really helped me align the focus of my life and the way that I'll live like forever now. Mm-hmm. And what did you draw upon during that time? Like what were some things that gave you strength or you focused on during that time? Well, certainly, um, I, my faith, like my personal faith, um, really strengthened during that time and in ways that are, um, kind of hard to articulate, but, you know, just feeling that rock bottom and really like not feeling like I had any strength of my own. I, I just really like quieted my heart and my mind. And I, I, I just, I learned and developed things that, um, 
and like allow God to to speak into my life in ways that I think, you know, when you're you're busy and you're chaotic or you have these goals you're working towards, like you just kind of, you know, you you push past that and you don't kind of sit still and listen. And so that was really important. And then I think developing relationships in ways that I hadn't before that weren't necessarily based on sports or running was really important for me. I decided to stay in Flagstaff, which is a running based community, but I stayed here because of the, just the community that I had and, and really beautiful people that um, I allowed to kind of let into my life and help me finally help me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, um, and then also, you know, one thing I, that my eyes were really open to is that running is a great sport, but it's also a very self-focused individual sport in many ways, especially at the professional level where, you know, you kind of have to be really focused in to, to be one of the best runners. And, um, and I kind of saw some of the, the negatives of that and maybe how if I at the time I thought you know if I'm able to to run again like I don't want it to be this way like I don't want it to just be this kind of selfish self-focused life that I live I I want it to be something different and so it gave me time kind of to gain this I don't know like this game plan of like how am I going to live my life moving forward how is it going to be meaningful like if I learned one thing from Ryan's loss, it's that um, life is very precious and very fleeting and you have to make the most of the opportunity and the relationship and the time that you're given. So, yeah, I, I just I don't know. I kind of kind of shook me a little bit, but I think in ways that are, are now good for me, I'm glad that I experienced that. Mm hmm. And so important. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about the relationships, because I think that's something that we just so often take for granted and. And, you know, that's one of the things I love about uh, working for Runners Connect is I get to spend all my day like building relationships and helping people and just knowing that it changes their lives. And to anyone listening, uh, you know, if I've helped you, that's that makes me feel good. So um, I'm glad you were able to find that yourself. And um, mm-hmm. was this about the time that you started working under the the legend that is Jack Daniels or was this, uh, before or after, like when, how did this, that play into it? Yes. Yeah, so I, I actually, um, knew Jack Daniels from back in my Stanford running days because he was one of the coaches and the physiologists for, um, the farm team at the time. So I kind of knew of him. And then when Ryan and I moved to Flagstaff in 2007, um, I had just started running after um, my head neck injury and Jack was my coach and I felt like the luckiest girl in the world that Jack (laughs) Daniels would like give me the time of day. But um, it was incredible. Like within a few months, I was like back to like the top fitness I had ever had and um, just really developed a friendship with Jack. And um, he's such a great human being and um, was an incredible resource for us to have in Flagstaff. And so um, kind of, you know, several years later when I was coming back to running, um, you know, I still maintained that relationship with Jack and was able to learn more from him as a coach myself, um, not just an athlete. And so I'm, I feel so blessed that Mm -hmm. I've, um, been able to spend so many hours sitting in his office learning. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm sure, I think he probably is, I don't know, in my opinion, he probably is the best known legendary running coach there is and uh you know he but he's kind of a bit of a mystery man in the running world that you don't see interviews with him you don't really hear much from him I've had plenty of requests to have him on the show but I haven't been able to get through and so it's just kind of cool to hear from someone who actually knows him and can kind of give us a bit of a glimpse into you know what he's like and how things are and so maybe you could share a bit more about the Run Smart project, what it is, and you know, just kind of how how that works within your, um, you know, coaching life. Mm-hmm. Well, so the Run Smart project was started by um, a guy out of New York, Brian Rossetti, and then a couple of my best friends here in Flagstaff um, that we all moved here together at the the same 
time, kind of the first like mass, like move of runners, distance runners to Flagstaff back in 2006, 2007. And, um, around that time, Jack had started the center for high altitude training here in Flagstaff, or he was the, the head coach and physiologist for that. Um, so we all kind of were like on underneath Jack or like in his office or listening to tell stories or he was timing our workouts. Um, and so when the Run Smart project continued to, to grow and build, and it, it was based off the premise of um, individualized personal training and coaching, um, it was only natural that they were able to twist Jack's arm <laughs> to come in underneath the Run Smart project and really help build it and grow it to something that you know, wouldn't be possible without his expertise and, and knowledge. And he certainly is a brilliant physiologist, but he's just like, it's crazy how many things he's experienced in his life. Like the running chapter is just like a little piece of like all the the things and stories and wild places he's lived and things he's done. And um, so he, he definitely brings like a wide uh wide range of, of expertise to the Run Smart project. And um, people adore him and they love listening to him. And um, I think it's mostly just because he's a great man and also um, a, a great scientist. And he is kind of a little bit of a Mr. Man just because he doesn't like, he doesn't do social media. Like he doesn't, he's not a businessman. Like he just does what he loves. And even if nobody knows about it. He'd keep doing it. So mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. maybe I can, I'll drop him a note and see if he can, he can he'll be on the show. Yeah, there you go. Although you've said it now live on air. So you've kind of, uh, you've set yourself up for that now. But <laughs> I'll follow um, through. <laughs> he seems like he'd be one of those people, you meet them every now and again, where everyone who meets them just wants to be around them. Like they don't care what they do. If they said, I'll meet you at 3 a.m. for coffee everyone would be like okay I'll do it like just yep. because you you he's just one of those people you just want to soak in every pos- every second you possibly can so that's this Absolutely. is very really cool to like learn about and how did your own coaching business kind of come out of this so um my well run smart has been incredible I think it's a great platform and I really um love the the vision that they've created Um, and I just wanted to, for me, like the best coaches that I've had have been, I just really hands-on and very specific and kind of developed in me a desire to kind of recreate that very personalized experience that I've benefited from so much. And, um, I, I kind of just wanted a little bit more just to roll my sleeves up and get in a little deeper with some athletes. And so, I created my own business. I still work for Run Smart and um, really enjoy the athletes I work with there. And then I kind of have my own coaching business, Alicia Shea Coaching, um, where I kind of get to do things exactly how I want to do them and, and you know, expand more into um, nutrition and just kind of more details of training that maybe I'm a little bit more limited to do with Run Smart. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, and I would definitely encourage people to check out um, Alicia's website. And I will put a link in the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC137. And, you know, you, as you mentioned, you have the coaching, you have the nutrition consultations, and I even mm-hmm. saw you have retreats on there. So um, do you want to kind of maybe tell us a little bit about what, what that involves with uh, some running retreats? Sure. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a developing um, idea that my husband, Chris Fargo, and I are looking to put into action in this next coming year. And the premise is that, you know, first we live in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is just like this mecca for running. Um, and then I've started doing more trail and ultra racing lately. And so I've been using, you know, not just the track and dirt roads and, and pavement around Flagstaff, but I've been up in the mountains, down in the Grand Canyon, the Red Rocks of Sedona. Um, We just have this like huge array of just beautiful, stunning um, trails and geography in Northern Arizona. And so part of it is we want to share that with other people. And we have a lot of requests that people want to come and visit and have us kind of show them around. But we also want there to kind of be like an educational component where 
um, we can personalize the retreats to, to what the athletes needs are. And, um, so have kind of it be part running tour retreat, and then also, um, you know, really equip athletes that they can leave being more knowledgeable and kind of having a better plan and direction for their own training. And we want to keep it with groups from like two to six, just so we can keep it really kind of intimate and personalized. And we're really excited about this. Um, I, like I said, I love flag stuff, so I, I'll show it off to anybody that wants mm-hmm. to travel out here. <laughs> so it's two to six people like mm-hmm. for a weekend. Yeah. So three to four days. Yeah. Okay. Three to four days is our, um, and we're going to have either a bed and breakfast option or a hotel option, kind of whatever oh. people feel comfortable with. And, um, yeah, we've, we've been kind of brewing this for a while and we're just finally going to, um, be able to get it set in motion. So we're really excited about that. Oh no, I love the idea. And I love that it's so, um, small and intricate and just, you know, really will allow you to get to know them and, um, you know, we, Renners Connect has our own uh, camp that we do at Zap Fitness in the summer mm-hmm. and, you know, it's great and it's wonderful getting to know people and, um, but it can be difficult as us coaches to kind of get to know all the campers when there's like 30 people. So yeah. I love that this is kind of more of a um, unique experience in that it's just a few of you and you get, you know, that anyone listening who wants to go, you'll really get to know Alicia um, and yeah. Chris really well. So Sounds awesome. And um, is there anything you want to say about why you believe retreats are just so beneficial on like a really deep level to runners? Yeah. So, well, just kind of like you mentioned camps, there's a lot of great running camps out there. Um, And like you said, it's kind of hard to get to know people. And, um, and so I guess it really just depends on what somebody is, is looking for. And Um, for us, what we are hoping is that this will be twofold. Like I said, education that's directed specifically to that person. Everybody has kind of different needs and questions, um, and a unique background in the sport. And then also just like inspiration because Mm. where we are, like, it's just, I mean, if you run down into the Canyon and to the, the Colorado river that carves, you know, millions of years has been carving through the Grand Canyon. Like there's no, um, there's no words to describe just how inspiring and beautiful that is. And it's, you know, it's, it's really a great boost for your own running and training. And it's, it's kind of hard to to quantify until you actually experience it. But Mm -hmm. those are the things that we're really hoping to leave people with. Yeah, no, I look forward to hearing more and maybe I'll, uh, I'll be trying to make Come an visit. appearance someday. <laughs> I have be been wonderful. talking about going to Arizona someday or sometime soon. So maybe this will be the kick I need. All right, yes. Alicia, um, I'm just going to take a moment to thank our sponsors and then we will be right back with the final kick round. Okay. Thank you to Sockney for sponsoring this podcast. Sockney is the favorite brand of runners everywhere. Now, I might be a little biased, but I absolutely love their running apparel accessories, and of course, shoes. I've been running in Saucony for almost three years and I love the brand like a friend. They don't just make fun clothes and shoes in beautiful colors or cool colors for my male listeners, but this is a brand that actually cares about us as runners, not lumping us in with other sports. Saucony truly puts the time and effort into thinking what we actually want and need. And to me, that means a lot. My favorite shoes are the Saucony Ride for Training Runs and the Saucony Fast Twitch for workouts and races. And I've also been trying out the new Freedom ISO they have coming out in December. It's been getting a lot of buzz and I can definitely see why. They're awesome. Get 10% off at Saucony.com by using coupon code TINA. Just don't get mad at me if you can't stop buying things on the website. I know I want it all and I'm sure you will too. Thanks to Body Health for sponsoring this podcast. So what is Body Health you ask? Well, as you probably know, the food and supplement industry is kind of corrupt and it can be so overwhelming to find products that will not cause us to grow an extra arm in 10 years. I'm joking, of course, but you know what I mean, right? It's hard to know who to trust. Well, I can give you one company who can be trusted, and that's Body Health. Their products are not only going to help you recover and therefore improve as a runner, but their motto of optimizing health and vitality is what they truly believe in. I take 5 to 10 of their perfect amino tablets every single day and it's made a huge difference to my recovery time. If you don't believe me, listen to this. 
Your body can only absorb and use 18% of the protein in whey and soy protein and only 48% in eggs. But our bodies can use 99% of the protein in perfect amino. Impressive, right? You can enter to win a pack of six bottles by visiting runnersconnect.net forward slash body health or you can get 10% off using coupon code TINA10. All right, Alicia, I just have five quick questions for you. Pretty simple and uh, nothing. We've gone over the deep deep stuff, so this is going to be interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. What is the greatest advice you've ever received? The greatest advice I've ever received is that um, God's grace is sufficient for us in our time of need. And that's just, you know, been my own personal story and journey. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's something I hold on to. Yeah, lovely. And if it, you know, that's the wonderful thing I love about these uh, greatest advice quotes. It's just you, you learn so much about the person from what the answer is. And it just, uh, if it helps you, you know, it may help other people, but at the same time, it, it's personal to you. So I love that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, favorite running book or blog? I love Alex Hutchinson's mm-hmm. um, blog. Um, he writes on Runner's World yep. and he's an exercise physiologist and he just does a really good job of sorting through the latest science with running and nutrition and kind of stripping it down and making it very understandable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And actually we are going to, um, Alex recently did an article about um, Kenyan runners and cadence. And I'm actually Mm -hmm. having the researcher from that study. Um, He will be on the show. I think it's next week. So stay tuned for that. Anyone listening. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing what everyone thinks of that one. Um, What would you like to tell a brand new runner? I would say to a brand new runner, um, find ways that make you find things that make you fall more in love with the sport. So, you know, whatever that looks like for you, specific races, training, running community, you know, don't do things that take away from making you love the sport more and more so you can do it for the rest of your life. Great advice. So important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, What is your pre-race meal? My pre-race meal is pretty much anything, but Mm -hmm. I really like um, fish or chicken, sweet potatoes, salad, like super simple. But sometimes that ends up being sushi or Mexican food. So I'm pretty (laughs) Wow, Mexican? That's impressive. (laughs) You must have a a rock solid stomach. Yeah, I, I can eat a lot of things, but I think Mexican, I think I'd have to draw the line there. (laughs) Okay. And uh, finally, your favorite running product. My favorite running um, product would probably be the um, Nike Wild Horse Trail Shoe, um, which is a shoe I run in um, pretty much every day and race in as well. And that's simply because it's a a trail shoe. And um, I live in Arizona and it's really, really rocky and technical. So I it, without that shoe, I just kind of beat my feet up a lot. <laughs> yep, very important there. Okay, and um, just, you know, some ways people can follow you. As I mentioned, I will put links in the show notes with um, your website and all the things we've talked about today. But uh, what would be the best way people can follow you if they want to kind of keep up to date with what you're up to? I'm on Facebook um, as Alicia Vargo. Um, I'm on Twitter as Alicia Vargo. I'm on um, Instagram is Alicia Bargo and mm-hmm. Strava as well. So okay. those four ways. And I, some of my names are maybe still Alicia Shea. I haven't changed everything over. So one of those two names, you can find me at all four of those things. Okay. And I will put links in the show notes just in case anyone is having trouble. All right, Alicia. Well, thank you so much for your time today for being honest and raw and just, you know, sharing your heart with us. And, and it really was appreciated. And, uh, you know, it was fantastic to talk to you and, uh, I'm sure you're going to inspire so many people today. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just love how open and honest she was and how she was able to share with us just how traumatic those experiences were and how they helped her to be a better runner and a better person. It makes me happy to hear that she's moved on and, you know, she's happy with her life now too. And as for those retreats, how amazing do they sound? I think I might have to book myself on one of those sometime soon. So we're well into the holidays and many of us are scrambling around trying to get the last of our Christmas gifts. But I want to remind you that both Socony and Body Health offer wonderful products that are great for the runner in your life. 
And what more could a runner want than to stay healthy using those perfect amino tablets? Um, They really help with recovery. And some beautiful new running clothes or shoes, um, which are enough for any runner to give us motivation on any day, no matter how crappy we're feeling. You can use coupon code TINA for 10% off at Socony.com and TINA10 for 10% off at Body Health. So I make sh- hope you will be sure to check those out. So next week, we'll be talking to Jordan Santos, a researcher who has been completing some very, very interesting research studies about runners, including talking about that famous 180 cadence recommendation that you hear over and over again which by the way Jordan has actually found to be completely useless for most people if you love the science or you want to get your running form right and that's something you've been focusing on this is going to be a must listen episode for you so thank you so much for tuning in and best of luck with that final last minute Christmas shopping until next week have a great week